Seeker, written by Susanna Thompson, performed by Heather Firth. Chapter 42 I laugh when I enter Justin's room and see him engrossed in his phone. Thanks for finding it for me, he says without looking up from the screen. Dad is smiling in amusement. He doesn't even need us here now that he's got that thing. I smile fondly at my brother. Did you call? His sharp glance at me makes me amend my question instead of mentioning Nor. Ah, uh, your friends? They're coming to see me after lunch, he replies. I'm allowed to have visitors now. Only family had been allowed to see him yesterday, which was why Silas had waited down in the lobby while I was up here with my parents. Hey, buddy, how's it going? I turn to see that my Uncle Dave has arrived. He wanted to be here yesterday, but he couldn't get a flight until early this morning. I remember visiting him in this very hospital. But he moved to Arizona a year after his cancer was cured. He's been back once for Christmas and once for Thanksgiving since then. Mom is with him, and she looks better than I expected, considering that she probably only dozed by Justin's bedside last night and got a short nap at home this morning before going to pick up Uncle Dave at the airport. It must be the happiness shining in her eyes that is making her look better rested than she is. Hey, Uncle Dave, Justin responds. You came all the way out here just to visit me in the hospital? Uncle Dave exchanges a look with Mom that's heavy with unspoken emotion, before replying to Justin in a lighter tone. Yeah, buddy, sure did. I'm glad to see you're feeling better. It's boring here, Justin tells him. I sure hope I can go home tomorrow. Mom speaks in wonder to her brother. They're saying they might actually be able to discharge him tomorrow. It's just incredible. Silas talked about it at church, I tell them. Everybody praised God for it. Silas? Uncle Dave questions. He's her boyfriend, Mom says. Fiance, I correct her. You'll meet him later, I blithely inform Uncle Dave. He went to pay for our dresses. Uncle Dave's eyebrows raise. You're both wearing dresses? I laugh at his bewildered expression. No, it's my wedding dress and my bridesmaid's dress. Oh, he responds, still looking a bit shell-shocked. But you're getting married? Maybe next year, Mom tells him. This year, I contradict her. We've decided on the day after my birthday, and we're getting married at Silas's church. Can you come? We're not having a reception, but we can go out to eat, I decide as I'm speaking. Uncle Dave stares at me before shifting his gaze to Mom. She's looking much less happy now. But I thought, we want you to be there too, I say after she trails off. Thanks for offering to pay for the cake and everything, but we don't need all that. We're just getting married at the church and going on our honeymoon. Honeymoon, she repeats with a shocked expression, like it's unusual to go on a honeymoon. Her reaction has made me uncomfortable talking about it. Yeah, so we don't need to mail out invitations. It'll just be at the church and going out to eat. Uncle Dave is still waiting for Mom to tell him what to do. Dad seems to be waiting to follow her lead, too. She regards me for a moment and then looks at Justin. Her expression is more serene when she looks back at me. We'll be there, she says. We will? Dad asks in surprise. Her gaze is filled with warmth when she looks at him. We have our kids, and that's all that matters. I understand the underlying message in her statement. They could have lost one of their kids yesterday, and she's not so worried about me making a mistake anymore as long as I'm alive and well. Thanks, Mom. I tell her, it'll be nice to have our family there. Our? Uncle Dave inquires quizzically. 
Silas doesn't have any family. I explain. We are all he's got. What about his uncle? Mom asks. I shake my head. He's not part of his life anymore since he turned 18. Thank goodness, I add silently as I think of Jack. I can see the compassion in my mom's eyes as she realizes that Silas is completely alone in the world. How can he do that to his nephew? It's okay, I assure her. Silas has God in his life. She appears startled by my answer. Your dad told me that you were going to church this morning. We did, I confirm. Silas spoke in church, and I could see him becoming a preacher, Mom. Everyone was praising God because of what he said. That's wonderful, she says, but she's looking at me like she doesn't know me. I know I stopped going to church for a while, I concede, but God still answered my prayers and healed Justin. I'll never be mad at him again. Why were you mad at me? Justin questions. Mom and I both laugh. Not you, I reply. I was mad at God. Oh, he responds, losing interest in the conversation again. Uncle Dave starts talking to him about snowboarding and tells him how he broke his leg skiing when he was Justin's age. The guys in our family are tough, he proclaims. I spend the rest of the time mostly listening to my parents talk with Uncle Dave. When Silas texts me that he has arrived at the hospital, I go downstairs to meet him. He comes up to Justin's room with me, and I introduce him to my uncle. Silas then turns his complete attention to Justin. I am glad that you are well. Thanks, Justin says without looking up from his phone. Do you know who wrote Moby Dick? Herman Melville. Silas replies without missing a beat. Thanks, Justin tells him with more enthusiasm than he had for Silas's comment on his well-being. Sweet, he exclaims after Silas helps him win several games of trivia crack. That's cheating, I remark with a smile. Justin ignores my comment and gazes at Silas in near awe. Bro, how do you know everything? The moment feels pivotal to me, since Justin has never paid much attention to Silas before. He'll be part of the family after I marry him, so my brother's acceptance of him is important to me. Hearing him call Silas bro makes me hope that he'll actually be like a brother to him eventually. I watch their little bonding interaction without saying anything to interrupt them. I studied many subjects for my GED test, Silas tells him. Good answer, I think, and contemplate how I was going to tell Justin the real truth about Silas. The opportunity for that seems to have passed now, and I reconsider my impulsive decision to confide in my brother. He had told me about Nor, but telling him about Silas would be a lot more complicated. There was really no need to share that with him, and he probably wouldn't believe me anyway since I have no proof of it. Silas has nothing from that time except his memories. That's a lot more studying than for regular school, Justin remarks. Doesn't seem worth it to me. It's not, Mom says. Wait until you start working. You'll wish you were back in school. Justin's dubious expression shows his doubt about that. I'll never wish I was back in school, he declares. You will, she insists. You'll miss those carefree days with no bills and no responsibilities. She gives me a pointed look. Her advice not to cut short my time in school doesn't convince me to postpone marrying Silas. My eagerness to start a family with him is as strong as when I first had the idea. But now I also feel the connection to God that I was lacking before. It has brought me complete contentment with my life. When God healed Justin, he also healed my heart. I'll always miss my friends, 
but I can think of them now without pain in my heart. I remember them with deep affection and feel their absence, but there is no longer a gaping hole in my life. God has given me all that I need. I have my family and my renewed faith. God provided everything that Silas needed to live in this world, and I believe that he will continue to provide for us after we are married. Mom is wrong that my carefree days are over, because I feel more carefree than I have in a long time. Putting my trust in God has freed me from my worries and brought me peace and comfort. I understand now why Silas needed God in his life, because I do too.